Welcome back everyone to Toxic Friendship Awareness Month. For episode two of this mini series, I have on with me Dr. Lauren Cook, a therapist, consultant, speaker, and author. I really wanted to get a therapist on this podcast, especially for this mini series. First off, you're the first psychologist we've ever had on, and I'm super excited for that because I think this is going to be the first of many, and I think this is a really unique series for you to be hopping on for and I think it's going to give people a perspective that they're not used to hearing regarding friendships. I think friendships are so complex. I think that there's so much to get into on friendship and I would I'm so excited to get your perspective and your insight on friendships. So welcome Dr. Cook. I am so excited to learn from you today. Thanks Sally. It's good to be here. I'm excited to dive in. It's going to be fun. (laughs) Okay, so we're going to start with just some background questions. Could you tell me a little bit more about your specific line of work and what area of psychology you practice in? Absolutely. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I have my master's in marriage and family therapy too. So I do a little bit of couples work and some friendship work too. But I'd say my main specialty is in anxiety. I'm very open about my own lived experience with anxiety. I am no stranger to a not so fun panic attack. We (laughs) often want to do the work where we have that lived experience ourselves. So that's why I really have a heart for anxiety. And I love helping folks with OCD, panic, social anxiety, generalized anxiety. There's a whole range of different experiences there. And friendships, relationships are often a huge part of why we feel anxiety. So that's 100%. kind of what I feel drawn towards. That's amazing. Whatever you specialize in, just hearing the perspective of someone who knows way more about relationships in general is going to be so helpful for me and for my listeners. So I'm super happy to have you here. Me too. Good to be in studio. Yes. Helping people with their relationships, both romantic and otherwise, is a big focus of your work. What initially made you interested in pursuing this? Mm. Well, we don't live on islands by ourselves unless you're Tom Hanks and Castaway, I suppose. (laughs) We are rooted in our relationships with people. And, you know, even though people can say, oh, you know, the way you make me feel is my responsibility, we have an effect on each other. And we actually, we see this on a neurological level. It's called mirror neurons. Same reason when you start crying, I'd probably start crying. Or if I start laughing, you start laughing. We affect each other. We have a contagious effect on one another. Absolutely. I'm fascinated by that. And I think it really plays into our well-being or when we're struggling. Yeah. So you touched a little bit on your anxiety and Mm -hmm. why that's something that is what you focus on mainly in your therapy. So what, if you're comfortable sharing, has your experience with anxiety looked like for you? Yeah, I really try and be an open book about my own experience. I think a lot of therapists have kind of kept themselves behind closed doors. And I think there's been a lot of stigma about mental health and therapy because people just haven't known what happens behind those closed doors. And so I think that's why you're seeing a lot of therapists start to disclose and share We're real human beings too. We have real struggles too. For me, my specific anxiety started at a really young age. Uh, I actually have what's called a metaphobia, which is a phobia of vomit. Not so fun. Wait. (laughs) Do you have that too? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I have a metaphobia, phobia of vomit. A fair amount of people do have this. For me, it started, you know, my mom had breast cancer when I was three years old, stage three. I'm very grateful my mom's a healthy survivor today but so much of my childhood my mom was throwing up sick almost died and there would actually be a lot of times that I would be taken out of the house you know with family being like oh we're trying to protect you from seeing this of course I don't actually remember any of all this these are things I'm told now right but I think my young self really internalized oh being sick losing control being taken away from my mom potentially losing my mom so it's fascinating as I've gotten older just having this like visceral fear to getting sick yeah it's a basic healthy human function right sometimes we have to get sick but I have like an instinctual reaction like panic attack run away when a friend is sick I feel awful (laughs) it's so crazy I am that person that can't hold your hair back and I feel like such a jerk for it it's okay but there it is it's okay there's no shame. No shame. <laughs> There's a whole community of people who are right there. All the emetophobes are <laughs> yeah. going to be like commenting to this. Um, but yeah, that's that's why I was drawn to work in anxiety because I know how physical it can be, how it yeah. feels like it's just taking over your body. And, you know, it really can feel illogical, right? Like on a logical level, we can say like, 
okay, if somebody gets sick, it's not that big of a deal. But you know if you've ever had any kind of fear before, it's just so real. And sometimes the body takes over. So I love to help folks with that so they don't feel like they're trapped to their anxiety either. Totally. And thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And I know Mm -hmm. my listeners will too. I think it's super interesting that therapists are starting to share more of their experiences. I just recently got a new therapist in the last few months and she shares so much about herself with me and I love it Mm. because it just makes her feel so much more real and relatable. And that's been something I feel like was lacking in a lot of therapy. Some therapists are just so like straight faced. They're not indulging. They're not really acknowledging that they are real humans. They almost feel robotic. So Mm -hmm. I think that can be something that turns people away from therapy. So I Mm. applaud you for being comfortable sharing who you are as well and making your patients and clients feel more comfortable and safe in the space. Oh, thank I you. Know it, I know it makes a difference, honestly. I can Aww. speak to that. Across all the different areas of our lives, we have different relationships, romantic partners, family members, coworkers, and of course, friends. From a psychology perspective, what role do friends play in our lives that maybe these other people can't fulfill in the same way? In other words, why is it important to have friends? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. You know, our friends, not only are they our peers, they are our mirrors. We were just talking about mirrors a moment ago, but they're so face to face in terms of having so many shared lived experiences, being of similar age. I mean, obviously friends can cross generations, but a lot of times our friends are close in age to us and they're going through some similar life experiences with us. The other thing is, you know, our friends, I'd say good friends, can help challenge us, can help us really lean into our vulnerability in maybe a way that we can't do with our parents or or even our partners sometimes. And friends also, I would say, stand the test of time a lot of times. You know, some dating relationships may come and go. Those solid friendships are there through thick and thin. I believe the stat is if someone has been a friend in your life for seven years, yeah, it's very likely it's going to be for life, which I've I think that. is pretty incredible. I have found that to be very true. There's been like maybe one hiccup in that for me. Yeah. But I think that that can also just go with like sometimes stats put a little too much pressure on you. thinking oh, yeah. That you have to do something or <laughs> believe something. So yeah. I do agree with that, though. I've I mean, I live with someone now who I've been friends with since I was in fifth grade and Aww. she's the best. So I love that. Yeah. What are some common difficulties you see people facing when it comes to their friendships? Well, to talk about the flip side of long-term friendships, I do see, I see this in dating too, what we call the sunken cost principle. It actually comes from economics, but it's really this idea that sometimes we can stay in a relationship for way too long and simply because that relationship has been around for a long time. We tell ourselves, well, I've been with this person for so long, I've known them, I can't let it go. And really we have to ask ourselves, okay, in the here and now, Yes, we're going to have some hiccups. We can't expect our relationships to be flawless. But is this relationship doing more harm than good and for an extended period of time? And if it is, that's something we have to let go. 100%. And the other thing I'll say too, you know, the number one reason people form friendships is because of proximity. The people that happen to be in your day-to-day life, that's actually the, the biggest likelihood of someone being your friend or not, if they live nearby you. And I think sometimes we can fall into these friendships of convenience. Yeah. Here's a person right in front of your face. Yeah. You got to ask yourself, do I actually like this person? Do I <laughs> like hanging out with you? And if I'm feeling obligated or if it's feeling like a box to check, expand your search because totally. don't fall for the friendships of convenience. A hundred percent. And I think that's a really interesting point when it comes to college students because that's like a time in your life where you're supposed to build the most meaningful friendships in your probably almost your entire life Mm. and it is a place where you meet friends because of proximity you know you're in a same place with the people who wanted the same things as you who wanted to be in the same place as you or Mm -hmm. sort of wanted to be in the same place as you and the people you become friends with are all in that circle so I just think it's really fascinating that like obviously that's a thing that is great to make friends in that setting and it's a great way to make friends that can last forever but it's also a lot of pressure and can be meeting people that you're just there at the same time with and maybe they aren't meant to be your friends yeah say i'd say that's even more true in high school yeah you know where in college you have tend to have so many people there you've got some options in high school 
it's an even more limited it's even pool. smaller yeah it's a yeah. way smaller pool yeah absolutely. it's crazy and I guess that's maybe a brief moment for me to give some advice to my listeners from my perspective and I'm sure you can touch on this too like if you're in high school and you're struggling to make friends or keep friends or your group keeps changing don't be too hard on yourself you're in the same place at the same time as these people and there's not as much space for you to really explore who you guys are so Mm -hmm. if you're struggling with that it's going to be okay there's so many other places and ways to make long-lasting friends and i said this in the last episode and i'll say it again quality not quantity that is the most important thing i could possibly say when it comes to friendships Mm -hmm. i i so agree with you on that you know And, and sometimes friendships are there for a season you know sometimes we are friends with people who are in our immediate vicinity for a time and as time goes on, we really see who's there to stand the test of time. And that's, that's okay. Who comes along and who maybe doesn't. Yeah. Do you have patients that seek you solely to talk about friendships and get your expertise on that? And what does that kind of look like from what you're allowed to share? Yeah, I actually had a client this morning. We were talking about this. People definitely see me for friendships, for dating. Friendship breakups are a real thing. They you know, are. We do not talk about that. <laughs> That's as a the whole point of this. <laughs> I know, exactly. I mean, we talk so much about dating breakups. We do not talk about friendship breakups. And I would argue they're often even more painful. Thank you. I mean, I literally <laughs> have like so many notes of what I want to talk to you about. And I have a whole blurb where I literally wrote that it's so commonly talked about that, you know, we go through breakups with our partners. We go through toxic boyfriends and Mm -hmm. girlfriends and you know all different types of relationships that with partners specifically that can be so draining and abusive and then we just kind of avoid the complexities of what it's like to lose a friend or be in a bad friendship I mean it can be so much worse it can be really bad so much worse and I'd say you don't get closure with friendship breakups. Typically in a dating relationship there'll be some kind of conversation some feedback of this isn't working for me Typically with friends, it's like a slow ghosting Mm -hmm. where you like start second guessing everything. And I'd say that's way more mental torture. A hundred percent. So why do you think managing our interpersonal relationships can be so challenging? Hmm. Well, I'd say, you know, especially for for folks tuning into this, probably some Gen Z, maybe some millennials, maybe a few Gen Alphas. I don't know. We are, so many of us are pulled into hustle culture of we've got to check so many boxes, so much to do in a given day. There's such a focus on becoming successful, achieving. You can't check a box for friendships. Yeah. You can't accomplish a friendship. And we're so goal focused. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big advocate of goal setting, but you can't really set a goal when it comes to friendships. It is a daily process of showing up for people. And it's really sad. I think we've kind of lost our ability to do something for the sake of doing it. A lot of us, we want those rewards. We want the payoffs. Friendships, it's a long-term investment. And you have to go in with a mentality of what can I give rather than what's this going to give me. Yeah. So now we're going to get into the meat of this episode, which I'm excited about. I know from experience that some friends can be more draining than anything else. It can be difficult to notice that for sure. What are some red flags to look for in friends that might signal they may not be right for you? Mm. Biggest red flag is a friend who gaslights you. Gaslighting is basically when you try and give feedback to someone, you're upset about something, and then they respond in a way where they turn it around on you, how you're a bad person or you're the one who's at fault, rather than listening and hearing what you're saying. Another thing is if you're feeling like the friendship is one-sided, you hang out with your friend, you go and grab a coffee, if they don't ask you one question about yourself, what's going on in your world, they talk about themselves the entire time, that's some data to work with. absolutely even on the other side of the gaslighting point that you made it's interesting like sometimes someone will come to you with so much feedback Uh, and then you'll come to them with your feedback mm -hmm. and the minute you do you never receive that validation it's like every time you've come to me i've always been if anything overly apologetic to Mm -hmm. a point to a fault even where my apologies might not even come across sincere anymore and then when it's the other way around you don't ever get that validation and if you're never getting validation from any of the ways that a friend is making you feel i feel like that's a 
very major red flag. I would say so. And, you know, no one's perfect, right? I think expecting our friends to be perfect is unrealistic. Yeah. If you find yourself feeling like you're auditioning with a friend after you've had a tough conversation and you feel like you're trying to win them over or they're holding a grudge over you, that's something you got to take a look at, you know, because, yeah, we mess up in our friendships. We try and do better. But if you feel like you have to be perfect in that friendship, yeah. how can you ever exhale? You, you can't. What effects, in your opinion, can toxic friendships have on your life and your mental health? They can take up so much of our mental energy where you just ruminate about it all the time. And it's interesting, right? Because there's a comfortability with friends, but it's not to the same degree as in our dating relationships. Couldn't agree more. Right? I always say when I have a crush on a guy or if I have something to say to a guy about how they made me feel or what they did, it will come out instantly. Like I will not hide from you for weeks to not tell you I like you or whatever it is. But when it comes to confrontation with a girlfriend... I shut down. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Or if someone's coming to me telling me something I did to hurt them, and I'm like, oh my God, like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, it, like, I shut down completely. It, heart racing, like, symptoms of a panic attack, honestly. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I think that's what's really sad about our friendships, especially I think sometimes female friendships, because with our dating partners, if it's going to work, we'll work it out, right? And the conflict can actually make the relationship better. Yeah. If it doesn't, bye. Yeah. But with our friendships, there's such a fragility to it of, oh, I don't know how this conflict is going to go. You could be somebody who cuts me out. You could be somebody who holds a grudge over me. And so many of our friendships are what I call fair weather friendships. They're great yeah. when they're good, and we have no idea how they're going to be when they're bad. And yeah. so we just avoid. I feel like if someone comes to you with feedback and it doesn't make you anxious, it just makes you open your eyes and acknowledge how you made that person feel and you are able to just take it as that and not have the full panic attack, that's a sign of a healthy friendship. Green flag. If it's someone who meets you with feedback and you are having a panic attack over it because that person being upset affects you so deeply that it's like almost non-functioning I think that can be a red flag in a friendship because what is it about that person that you hold them to a certain standard that like it's going to shut down your day so deeply that you can't work through it because I Mm. think that the communication is super different when I've had good friends come to me they're like I we're still friends I still love you I'm never going to not be here for you but this is something that I care about to share with you Mm -hmm. and then there's other people who are like mean and Mm. use words that are very combative and Mm -hmm. that don't make you feel safe to say anything other than oh my god I'm so sorry and just completely shut down and beg for forgiveness which Mm -hmm. I don't think is healthy either no no and I, I would say you know it's nuanced with that because some people will have like a panic attack no matter how the feedback is that given. That is very true. You know, so, <laughs> very so I think you have to ask yourself, okay, is this about how they're giving me the feedback or is this just my reaction, like my little inner child being like, I'm in trouble and I'm freaking out. Yeah. I think it really depends on how the person is, is sharing the feedback with you, right? Are they yeah. checking in with you? Are they being kind about it? If they're being a jerk, that says a lot right there. Good point. Are there different types of toxic friends? Well, I don't have any like specific designations necessarily, but I think it's good to implement a little attachment theory here. I love attachment theory. Basically, in a nutshell, we have secure relationships, we have anxious attachments, avoidant attachments, and disorganized attachments. The ideal is we have these secure friendships, right? I'm there for you, you're there for me. Anxious attachment is that clingy friend. You're not there for me one time and now I'm going to lose it because you don't have my back, right? They lack a trust in the relationship that you're going to be there. And those can be those really suffocating friendships. Then we have our avoidant attachers who they're there for us when it's convenient. They don't really get close. It's small talk. They don't go deep with us. And the second they lose interest in us, they're out. And then we have our disorganized attachment. And these are our I love you, I hate you friends. And these are the most confusing relationships because it's either super solid or they're like raging on us. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely experienced You've experienced. (laughs) And those are the most confusing because you're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. And it makes confrontation really confusing because it's hard to even hear what they're saying because their confrontation can be so intense and so chaotic that you're like, oh my God, yesterday you're saying I'm your sister and we're never going to not be family. And then it's today I did something that 
doesn't seem even that severe Mm -hmm. more so could be just a chill conversation and it's like whoa these are big words exactly (laughs) Exactly. and those people tend to like come right back around and love you right again Mm -hmm. but you when you get burned by it you can't just jump back in so easily usually yeah and i think sometimes why it's hard to like work through those types of friendships is because once you're met with the feedback and you give an apology all they wanted was an apology. They don't actually want to work through the complexities and nuances of what they're saying. Yes. So it's kind of interesting because your apology is immediately met with, all right, I'm back to, I love you. You're my best friend. Let's hang out right now and hang out every single day. It's hard to really navigate building a foundation in those kinds of friendships. Mm-hmm. And I think it takes a really strong person on the receiving end of that to not personalize it, right? To yeah. know this is about you and your pain being projected on me. Yeah. Yes, I'm open to the feedback if I made a misstep, but a lot of times it's about you putting your stuff on me and Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of on the receiving end of that. Totally. How do you determine whether a friend is worth fighting for and trying to work things out with or if it would be better to just go through the horrible friendship breakup? (laughs) I love that question. My favorite thing to ask is, would I be sad if this person wasn't in my life a year from now, five years from now? Yeah. And just ask yourself that, and that tells you pretty much everything you need to know. I literally said pretty much exactly word for word in my last episode. I said, if you have a friendship breakup with someone and you feel relieved or you feel like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders, don't question it. Yep. <laughs> like that was That's the right. right call. You did the right thing. <laughs> you're gonna be okay. Once you notice that you have a toxic friend, what would you say is the best way to start removing them from your life? I'm always an advocate of open communication. No one likes to be ghosted. No one likes to sit up at 2 a.m. at night. We've all been there before. What did I do? What did I say? You probably did say something, you know? (laughs) (laughs) If they're pulling back from you. And as tough as it is, asking for the feedback and saying, listen, I know we may not be friends, I just want to grow. I want to learn. Can you give me some feedback uh, of why we're maybe not as close anymore? Yeah. That opens the door for that person to share genuinely what it is, you know, because a lot of times our friendships fail and we don't know why. Yeah. So how would you recommend someone takes care of themselves after distancing themselves from a friend? (sighs) Circle yourself with people you do feel good around. You know, not necessarily people who will be your choir of like, oh, you can do no wrong. I agree with that. You know, I think it actually, many of us are agreeable. I tend to be agreeable myself. And sometimes the best friends are the ones who tell you what you don't always want to hear. Yeah. It takes a really brave friend to do that. And often we have to give our friends permission to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But surround yourself with people who are going to have your back, who remind you that you do have self-worth. Because we often really doubt ourselves when a friendship breakup happens. Yeah, and I think that those are the people that probably gave you the reasons to not want that friendship in the first place. So you don't even have to necessarily talk about it with them, but just surrounding yourself with them as a constant reminder of why you made that decision to distance yourself can be so reassuring, I feel like. 100% agree. So if you're cutting out toxic friends, you may find yourself needing some new, better friends. Or maybe you moved to a new city or your friends moved away or maybe you just want some new people in your life. Mm -hmm. What are your tips for making new friends? (laughs) That is a great question. You know, okay, you'll probably laugh at me for saying this, but... I often joke with my husband, there needs to be like a dating app, but for friends. I knew, I knew you were going to say that. I literally <laughs> How knew. Did you know? I just know. I just knew it. You just know. I'm, I'm getting to know you every few minutes and I'm like, all right, <laughs> I get it. But no, I think really like talk to people, like put your head up from your phone. You know, like when I fly, I will talk to the people sitting next to me. I'm the same way. Yes. So do that. And also join groups. Like when I moved to Pasadena, I joined like the junior league or like join a place of faith. Like you need communities. Like we are community based human beings. Absolutely. So find groups. I think groups and just like clubs and yep. making friends just at a store. Like I yes. do it all the time and it's just like a nice way to spend your day. Even if they don't end up being a friend, it's just lovely to come home with a new story to share of someone you spoke to. Exactly. I feel like it's easy to get discouraged when you're trying to meet new people. How would you suggest to others that they find the motivation to keep going? Mm. 
your your right friends are out there you know you will find people that you connect with and i will say this be your true self like people often take six months to show their true colors in dating and then we end up in these relationships where it's like this is not who i thought i was with (laughs) you know and the same thing happens in friendships so like what you like beat to your own drum and you'll find somebody else who likes to beat their drum that way too so to bring the anxiety aspect kind of back into this What is your advice for people with social anxiety who are trying to make new friends? You have to just jump in the pool. And sometimes it's a baby jump. But I'm a huge kind of behaviorist at heart, really. You have to show yourself that you can do it. You can spend all day trying to talk yourself up and think, you know, okay, let me muster up the courage. No, you got to go do it. It's the same thing with beating imposter syndrome. Show yourself that you're capable. Then your brain starts to buy in. It's cognitive behavioral therapy. Like yes. let's say you just go to an event. You don't talk to a single person. That's one step. Like yep. you showed up. You didn't stay in when it was more comfortable to stay in. And then it's like you slowly keep adding in. Okay, maybe tonight I'm going to talk to one person. Or totally. the one person I'm going to talk to is when I get a drink. And maybe I'll ask him how his day was. And that's yes. one step, you know. I think that can be. You've been doing your anxiety hierarchy. Oh. I can tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been, I have done CBT for a long time. So we talked about making friends. We've talked about distancing yourself from bad friends. Now I want to talk about keeping friends. Mm -hmm. So what are your best tips for sustaining friendship over time? Show up for your friends. Make it more about how you can be there for them than what they can do for you. It floors me. And I see this even with some of my own friends sometimes, especially people who've been in my life a long time, how we either stay in the small talk space or we just talk about ourselves. You have to ask your friends what's going on in their life, what's going on for them. Take that time to show that you care, that you're interested, um, and don't just make it about yourself. Yeah. I feel like we all talk about love languages and romantic relationships, (sighs) but I'm curious what your take is on love languages and friendships. 100% translates to friendships. Know how your friends like to be loved, not so much how you like to be loved, but what does your friend need? So Uh, true. Take the quiz. That's hard to do. That's what you just said is so hard to do, knowing that it's not how you want to be loved always. It's how they want to be. And that can be different from what you want. And don't let that be a reason that that person disappoints you. If you have different expectations or different standards for what feels like a good friend to you, like you have to find those balances and see them for what they are. Well said. I used to text my friends literally all the time. Like I'd have this thing where I'd have to like wake up every day. I had a list of people who I had to show love to every single day. It was like I didn't feel like I was a good friend if I didn't send this good morning text or I felt like I had anxiety wondering if that person found a reason to be upset with me from the last time we spoke. And I think that 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 feeling was created from people who weren't treating me great, but also from me and my own anxiety and my own insecurities. I think it was like, it was always exacerbated in the friendships that weren't meant to be for me. So Mm. I actually use that as a tool for myself to find red flags. And I know that's not the same for everyone, but for me, it has been such a useful tool because I notice that when I'm doing those things or feeling that way, like it might not be working and it might be too forced and it might be adding anxiety to my life and it might not be helpful for another person either because I don't think it's fair to someone else to feel like they're receiving something just because someone's checking a box. And I don't view it as me checking a box, (laughs) but I think it almost is such an anxiety thing that it's hard to not do it ah well that may be something to play with a little bit yeah to lean back in the (laughs) hammock of friendship you know and see what happens when it feels like okay we know we're there for each other but it doesn't have to be a constant knock a hundred percent you don't have to talk to someone every single day for it to mean that they're your best friend do you think that it's harder for your patients who suffer from anxiety to deal with the ebbs and flows of friendships I would say so sometimes at the start, but my favorite thing that I see with my clients is that they do the work, you know, they show themselves that they're capable. And I think the big thing to practice in friendships is that assertive communication of sharing how you actually feel, not being passive aggressive, not being passive or aggressive. You're just honest. And you see very quickly who those people are that can appreciate that assertiveness. Yeah. Versus the people who only liked you when you were passive. I don't know if you might be coming along for that. Yeah. You know? 
So I want to end on a more personal question. Uh-huh. What do you love the most about your friends? Oh, I'm I'm wearing my little auntie bracelet right now. Aww. My best friend just had her first baby. She is my sister. Uh, we're both only children, but she's my sister. Mm-hmm. You know, my friends, my my real true ones, we cheer for each other. Yeah. I've had some friends who not that they're threatened, but there's a competitiveness sometimes, you know, uh, and I'm a speaker, I'm a psychologist. I want to have women in my life who are excited and supportive of me in the same way I'm excited and supportive of them. Yeah. Who ask me how I'm doing and how things are going. Um, 100%. Because I'm always asking people in my job. It's always about someone else. And so when I have a friend who's willing to just ask the simple question of what's going on in your life and we're able to have a back and forth yeah. rather than what feels like a therapy session yeah. <laughs> for my friend. 100%. That to me is a sign of a, a friendship I'm really grateful for. Yeah. I feel like it can be hard as a therapist. I mean, I'm not speaking from experience, but as a therapist to like find ways to be a good friend and not be giving tips from like your therapy brain. You know what I mean? (laughs) I can't. That's something I actually have wondered about. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's not that it's a switch that we turn on and off, but I definitely feel like I show up differently with my friends than with my clients. Oh, of course. And I think that's boundaries. Yeah normal for sure okay everyone we are going to transition now into this week's segment of alpes three we are going to do three songs that you love listening to with your friends so if you were to go on a road trip this weekend with your friends what are the first three songs that you're putting on your playlist oh okay first whitney houston i want to dance with somebody love it just heard it at a wedding this weekend love that song (laughs) Uh, next one, I'm a millennial, so we gotta have a little Britney Spears toxic. I love that. That's <laughs> such a good song. <laughs> and the last one, we always play this song whenever I'm on a road trip with one of my best friends, Abby. We love a little country, Strawberry Wine, Deanna Carter. Ooh. You probably don't know that song. I like country music, though. I I'm gonna listen to it. Okay. It's like a good 90s hit, and we belt it out. Okay. Every time we go to Mammoth. Gonna add that to my list. I'm excited. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. Before we wrap up, I want to ask you if there's anything you want to share with my listeners about where they can follow you, what else they can learn from you, what you just want to share with them about yourself. Yeah, so people can get in touch with me at Dr. Lauren Cook. Go to my website, drlaurencook.com. I travel all around the country, speak about mental health, my private practice. It's virtual, but I'm able to work with any client in the state of California, so folks can reach out to me there. Uh, And stay tuned. I'm in the process of writing my third book right now. It's amazing. all about anxiety and what we can do about it and why we're more anxious than ever before. So I'm really excited to, to finish writing that. Well, thank you so much. It's actually been so lovely to have you here. I've learned so much from you, but I've also felt so validated by everything that you've said. And I think that's super special. I think it shows like how much work I've put in on myself and how much time I've clearly spent in yeah. therapy because <laughs> everything you say, I'm like, yeah, I get that. I, I relate to that. Mm. So I appreciate you sharing so much. Thanks for having me on, Ali. This has been you. fun. I'm excited for the rest of Toxic Friendship Awareness Month. Be sure to keep tuning in to learn more about friendships with me. I will see you guys next week. Thank you again, Dr. Cook. You were amazing. Thank you.